So James E. Strick, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics podcast. We thanks are, for inviting me. We are going to be discussing uh, your book, which I believe was published in 2015 by Harvard University Press, Wilhelm Reich, Biologist. And as people will imagine from the title, it is about Wilhelm Reich, but it's not as focused on the specifically psychoanalytical aspects of his work that you'd find in his books, character analysis, function of the orgasm, even though at the beginning of your book, you do introduce this stuff as it's needed for your own focus, but your own focus and this book specifically, the bulk of it is about whether or not the bion experiments and the notion of the orgone, and I guess in full orgone therapy, whether or not there is actually any biological truth and scientific truth and what's really going on with this. And this is, I should say, it's a sort of a good in-between between an introduction and a very scholarly, you know, let's take a look at this seriously and see what's going on. It's a great book. It's a beautiful edition as well. And, um, you know, it was a real pleasure to read. But before we jump in with the book, I mean, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how it was that such sort of a rare and I would say a little bit risky book came to be came to be written um yeah i would say that that's accurate to call it a somewhat risky book um it's not a book i would have written before i had earned tenure at the college that i teach at um and uh i mean just about myself i was originally a biologist um and trained in microbiology and uh i was interested in teaching high school biology and chemistry, which I did for about 10 years. And I had a side interest in the history of science. Uh, I was using case studies from the history of science in high school biology and chemistry teaching. And I found them um, really exciting pedagogically. It was a real way in for science phobic students. And I began to realize that it had a tremendous amount of potential for science teaching but that if I wanted to really tap that potential, I would have to get a much broader background in the history of science than what I could just read on my own avocationally. So uh, I went back for a PhD in the history of science, um, in the, a program in the history of science at Princeton University and uh, specialized in the history of microbiology uh, since that was the field where I felt I had the greatest amount of technical competence. In history of science, um, a lot of times you write about controversies and it's really important to be able to distinguish, did a controversy come out the way it did um, because of the evidence or what role was played by what historians sometimes call external forces? Like, you know, who was paying for funding of what kind of questions getting asked? Um, and uh, it always seemed to me that even when I was teaching high school, these case studies about origin of life research, um, the history of spontaneous generation, et cetera, were sort of great cases for a historian to look at because the external forces were never absent. Um, you know, the question of the origin of life always attracted interest from people's religious point of view and social institutions with a religious uh, bias. And so that, that sort of thing was never absent from the picture. And it was always interesting to be able to weigh the relative importance of these external forces versus the evidence itself in making sense of how an experimental controversy was in the end resolved who was declared to be the winner and who was declared to be the loser. So most of my research as a historian of biology and medicine has been about um, the ideas and experiments about the origin of life. And uh, my first book was about Darwin and his chief lieutenants arguing amongst themselves in the first 20 years after the origin of species came out. Well, what does this book mean about where the first living thing came from? And Darwin himself being extremely ambivalent on that question and waffling quite a lot. Um, it was a really fascinating story. 
So there was a lot of dispute among the Darwinians, but they tried to keep it out of public view because they felt like they already had enough problems with their critics that anything that showed division among their ranks would just expose them to more criticism and make them look weaker. Um, my second book was about what happened. It gets a patron with big money for the first time ever. It's kind of an obscure, interdisciplinary, esoteric corner of research. Nobody goes into it for the money, really. Um, but uh, in 1960, for the first time, there was a patron with big money really interested in funding origin of life research. And it was the U.S. Space Agency, NASA. And my book tries to explain um, what origin of life research was like before NASA got involved and in what way the patronage, um, the money, steered people. Uh, what, what kind of questions did they start asking? NASA was obviously interested in the question because they wanted to know how to look for life on other planets. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you would have to do would be to know, well, what kind of conditions are necessary for life to come into existence? And therefore, what planets should we not waste our time on? Because they just don't have the necessary raw materials or the necessary temperature, et cetera. Um, but out of this, a huge amount of research got done, and there were just a number of really remarkable spin-offs, like uh, Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. A lot of that funding came from NASA at the beginning. Um, his collaborator on that, Lynn Margulis, an American microbiologist, uh, and her serial endosymbiosis theory about the origin of eukaryotic cells, almost all of that was funded by NASA money from this program. So it was um, a really fascinating story about how origin of life research became even more interdisciplinary and connected up with so many other fields than it had been to begin with, not just biochemists, but geochemists and planetary scientists and astronomers, et cetera. Um, I heard about this case of Reich's bion experiments uh, when I was in microbiology grad school. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, wow, why hasn't some historian of science written this up? This is a fascinating story. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want to read a book about how does a student of Freud, a <laughs> radical Marxist psychoanalyst and a Jew end up in the 1930s doing origin of life experiments? Um, and by the time I finished my second book and realized that Nobody still has written this story. What's going on? Um, I, I started looking into it myself. And um, suffice it to say, Reich has such a bad reputation among scientists, particularly because in the end, he was um, imprisoned by the US government, the Food and Drug Administration, brought a case against him claiming he was a medical charlatan and um, Reich died in a federal prison. And ever since, um, the official story written by the US FDA has been, this was all a bunch of pseudoscientific nonsense. And what seemed interesting to me, especially from the point of view of somebody with training as a microbiologist was, wow, I wonder if I could go back and dig into the details of these experiments enough to evaluate that claim, to find out whether or not the reason that these experiments were so widely dismissed out of hand is because they really didn't have any scientific substance to them. Mm. Um, and Reich really was out of his depth, wandering out of psychoanalysis and into physiology and eventually even microbiology. Um, or was it a more complicated story, like so many of the other stories about origin of life experiments had been, where politics and religion and so many other factors were involved. Um, and what I really hoped for was that uh, Reich's laboratory notebooks would have been preserved um, so that it was possible to see whether or not what was happening in the laboratory day by day corresponded to what was written up in the published versions of these bion experiments. That seemed to me like it would be a very telling indicator and uh, Reich, like many psychoanalysts, left a provision in his will that said his archives were closed to scholars until 50 years after his death. 
essentially until after most of the patients had died and therefore um, it, it would no longer be nearly as controversial whether uh, their papers were open to scholars. Um, of course, once HIPAA was passed, there's restrictions at access to patient records anyway, but there was no HIPAA at the time that Reich and most of the other psychoanalysts were writing their wills. So uh, that meant that Reich's archives opened in November of 2007. And fairly soon after that, I uh, got permission to go work there and to try to find those laboratory notebooks, which did in fact exist and made it a much easier and more interesting job to uh, complete the research for the book that I was contemplating. So it's kind of a long and winding road, um, but uh, it did feel to me like it vindicated all the things that I thought were going to be interesting about the story at the beginning. Um, and I mean, just not to give a spoiler or anything, <laughs> but I mean, the basic take home uh, conclusion that I come to at the end of the book is uh, the reason the experiments are widely dismissed by the scientific community, at least this particular set of experiments, ha has nothing to do with evidence disproving them. Um, the vast majority of scientists who were the most extreme critics never even bothered to try to replicate the experiments. They completely dismissed them out of hand. And I explore uh, quite a few different possible reasons uh, why that might have been the case. Uh, so uh, that's the main take home message from, from the book, I guess. Uh, and I'm inviting biologists who I hope might be interested in a story like this to uh, go back and look at the experiments and see whether or not uh, there might be anything to them or the, whether or not they might see some of the same results as Reich, but perhaps interpret them differently. But um, I think I've concluded pretty decisively, whatever this is, it's not pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's true to say that not only did his work was was his work sort of systematically attempted to be destroyed by the FDA. I think it's the only case in America where that actually where that actually happened, where the FDA has sort of gone to the laboratories, you know, axes to the organ machines and burnt all the papers. Um, I'm not one hundred percent sure that mm -hmm. that is true. They certainly did imprison at least one other person. Um, a guy named Dinesh Souza, who was selling something called the Spectrochrome, mm -hmm. um, which genuinely was pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that case was brought by the FDA in the mid to late 1940s, not long before the Reich case. And I'm quite sure that that colored their judgment about the Reich case and that it was a, a, a mold into which they thought this case also fit and that they didn't look as closely at it as perhaps they should have to see whether or not it really was um, pseudoscience uh, or, or whether it, it just fulfilled their expectations for what something that they thought pseudoscience and medical charlatanism would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I'll say a little bit more about that later because the FDA had some um, astonishingly um, uh, unorthodox motives <laughs> for their persecution of Reich. Well, before we, we jump in to sort of build this the debate up to get through to the FDA, uh, I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? And Wilhelm, I will say Wilhelm Reich is already there, but if you if you don't want him in the room, which would be understandable. Oh, for God's sake, I definitely want him in the room. <laughs> I've gotten really interested in him by working on this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's already there. And then uh, three more, three more people. But I get to pick three more. This mm -hmm. is one of the hardest questions I think I've ever been asked. <laughs> That's what not everyone's because saying. not not because there aren't enough, but because there are too many. I mean, I'll tell you, the first two I arrived at without nearly so much struggle. But for the third person where I'm like running out of options, I got a list of like four or five and I can't get it down to just <laughs> that one last person. So I'll try that out on you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is in any particular order, maybe chronological. Um, uh, Baruch Spinoza. Uh, I've been reading a book recently. Um, uh, Claire, what's her name? Um, 
a, a, a British writer who's written a book called Spinoza's Religion that is really fascinating to me. Um, four or five years ago, there was a, a widely read book called uh, The Radical Enlightenment mm -hmm. by a guy named Jonathan Israel. And uh, um, he made the argument that Spinoza's philosophy, obscure as many people might think it was in the late 17th century, um, was one of those things that was just so shocking and radical that everybody was talking about it. Everybody pretended they hadn't read it because it was just so radical and disreputable that you didn't want to say, oh, I have a copy of that. <laughs> it's like uh, Lamatrie's book, Man and Machine, in the 18th century. I mean, you know, illegal in most countries. So nobody was going to say, oh, yeah, I read that. That was fascinating. But they would say, well, I've heard that he said da 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 And Spinoza, according to this book by Israel, is just so incredibly influential on most 18th century Enlightenment thinkers and everything that we call, you know, the modern project that came out of the Enlightenment. Um, and uh, so when I heard about this book, Spinoza's Religion, I thought I would look at it in, in more detail. I am no kind of philosopher mm -hmm. or religious studies person. But as I said, um, theological ideas and religious dogma are very often hovering on the margins of the stories that I look into about the origin of life and scientific attempts to explain the origin of life. Spinoza came across to me as just the most incredibly intelligent person. And um, I mean, intelligent in a way that when they say people were ahead of their time, I mean, it was able to see so clearly the the damage from the way that most people dealt with religious ideas and the previous 300 years worth of religious warfare that Europe had lived through after the Reformation. And um, it's just it's a it's a really remarkable book. And I just found myself saying, God, what I like to talk to this guy <laughs> or even just sit in the room and listen to him explain to somebody else he's very clear in his explanations although they do wander into philosophical latin which is um i mean it, the book spinoza's religion makes it all intelligible in english and mm -hmm. i i found that extremely helpful so he's a, somebody i would put in the room mm -hmm. um the second person uh who, who would be albert einstein um not least because Reich had some contact with him and asked him for advice about some of his experiments when his experiments began to verge even over beyond biology and into physics. And um, Einstein at first was incredibly interested in Reich's uh, <laughs> ideas and then very coolly cut off contact afterwards. This, you know, from the point of view of somebody who's a historian of science, it's just inviting somebody to go and try to figure out what happened. But there isn't much in the way of um, records other than just the direct correspondence between Einstein and Reich. And I mean, he's a brilliant guy. He's a guy who's already circulating petitions in World War I, asking scientists to refuse to do war work when wars break out and he's a part of a very tiny minority of scientists who are signing petitions like that during world war one and considered incredibly um you know unpatriotic and uh etc in, in germany at the time um but uh you know he's the guy who thinks that pacifism is the way and yet um, I teach a course about nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and nuclear waste disposal. Mm -hmm. And students come away from this course just totally scratching their heads about Einstein. Wait, this was the ultimate pacifist. But when some of the other physicists came to him in the summer of 1939 and said, you have to write a letter to President Roosevelt, and you have to convince him because you're the only physicist with a name big enough that he'll actually read the letter. <laughs> you have to convince him that the United States needs to build an atomic bomb. Mm. I mean, and, and Einstein is persuaded and does it. 
And of course, as a lifelong pacifist, after Hiroshima, considers it the worst mistake of his entire life. But um, he's just such an enigmatic and fascinating figure to me in so many ways. But I'd really like to see if he was in the room with Reich, if he would ever open up and talk honestly about why he cut off contact with him. I have my pet theory about that, but it's, you know, pure speculation. So um, I would love to get some more data on that subject. <laughs> Who would the third person be? Okay. Well, <laughs> as I told you, I have a very hard time just picking three. My short list for the third spot includes Hippocrates. Um, I mean, I teach the history of medicine, and there's just so many things about Hippocratic medicine that have been lost to our great disadvantage in the modern era. Um, most of all, first, do no harm. <laughs> um, but um, Galileo, I mean, I'd be really interested to hear Galileo talk about his thinking about how he dealt with the Inquisition. Reich took a great deal of interest in Galileo, particularly because of how he dealt with the Inquisition. Um, Louis Pasteur, oh my God. If you're interested in history of uh, experiments about spontaneous generation, here's a guy whose mind you would really like to look into. And in fact, the reason I decided to go for a PhD in the program that I did at Princeton is because of an article I read by a professor at Princeton about Pasteur and his opponent, Pouchet, mm -hmm. in one of the famous 19th century controversies over spontaneous generation mm -hmm. experiments. An article that was just so brilliant and so intelligent and so clearly written, I thought, wow. Could I do something like that? Um, uh, who else is on that short list? Ben Franklin, hero of mine since boyhood. I currently live in Philadelphia. You can't not be interested in Ben Franklin and still live in the city of Philadelphia. Um, you know, experimenter, diplomat, business person, you know, created the first fire department in Philadelphia, created the first public library in Philadelphia, created the first hospital in Philadelphia. There's nothing this guy didn't do in terms of being a civic patron um, mm -hmm. and, a, uh, uh, and, a, and a real, you know, independent thinker. Um, but like so many other people in the 18th century, um, you know, also had some of the prejudices of his time that he couldn't see beyond. He wrote a famous essay in 1751 lamenting mm -hmm. the influx of the degenerate Germans into Philadelphia that were polluting the Anglo-Saxon stock here. <laughs> and he saw the Germans as black. And it, it's hard to understand how in 1751, somebody could look at Germans from the Rhineland and see black people, but that's what he saw. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, this is just a character I really wish I could have known personally. Um, okay, just one more. I'll squeeze in one last okay. person on the list. Jennifer Doudna, um, the person who did finally get the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 system that does genetic editing in bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an intense competition about this because a lot of money was riding on patents for who was considered to have the patent rights. And her laboratory <clears throat> lost the patent battle in the courts to a competing laboratory at MIT. But <clears throat> the Nobel Committee said, this is not right, and gave her the Nobel Prize, and not the people at MIT who obtained the patent rights in court. So there's some kind of historical justice there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear her talk about that case. <laughs> I mean, a really brilliant scientist, but somebody who I think was also pretty savvy at navigating the modern landscape of money in science, um, which has become a bigger and bigger part of what it means to do science since World War II anyway, when science has become so expensive. All right, that's a really long answer. <clears throat> yeah, well, no, no, it's, it's a great room. And I think there is, a, there is a lot of clear connections between them. One thing that would personally interest me, there was a book I read quite a while ago about the debate between Pasteur and, you know, the germ, germ versus terrain theory. Uh -huh. and, and I would want to ask Pasteur, I'd say, 
were your last words actually the germ is nothing the terrain is everything because that's the that's the old no, farewell right that's the i really want to like because that's the uh you know as i understand i'm obviously i don't know as much as yourself but near the end there he was moving more towards th this whole thing is far more gray than i first realized and oh yeah that, that final death blow of look the germ is nothing the terrain is everything i would want to say did, why did you need to say that was your last words uh, he's at least partly saying it just to stick a thorn in the side of Robert Koch in Berlin, who still believes that the germ is everything, but who is Pester's main rival. And of course, Pester hates the Germans, especially after the Franco-Prussian War. I see. Um, and, you know, the humiliation and the abdication of the emperor and everything. Um, but yeah, his next to the last words or <laughs> someplace there right near the end were to his family. Um, there was this stack of, I don't even remember, I think it was 195 laboratory notebooks from one of the most brilliant and fruitful scientific careers that ever existed. And his command to his family quite near his death was, never, ever, under any circumstances, let the public see these notebooks. <laughs> have we, have we, we've seen them since or not? <laughs> well, um, if you're... If you uh, you know have an interest in Pasteur, um, pick up the biography that was written by the guy that I eventually went to work for my PhD under, mm -hmm. um, Gerald Geeson. Um, it's called The Private Science of Louis Pasteur. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you something, reading Pasteur's cramped little handwriting in the margins of those notebooks was quite a training exercise in how to read primary source documents. But... Um, there's so many things that Pasteur wanted kept from the public, um, even from some of his most famous success stories. And um, the book, The Private Science of Louis Pasteur, is about all of Pasteur's successes and his brilliance as a scientist and as an organizer of scientific work. Mm -hmm. But it was also about uh, what, a, what an operator he was. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a person who knew how to manipulate public relations as a person who knew um, if you're familiar with the famous demonstration that he did of his anthrax vaccine in 1881 at a little rural town in france called puy le four where he inoculated 50 sheep with his vaccine and 50 other sheep were not inoculated and they were all exposed to anthrax mm. and reporters from all over europe were there telegraphing back to the london you know, uh, times every day, the progress of the experiment. And it was spectacular. All 50 sheep that were inoculated survived. All 50 sheep that were not inoculated died. Mm. And suddenly a huge number of doctors who'd been very skeptical about vaccines came over to the germ theory. Mm -hmm. But um, it turned out that in those notebooks, if you looked closely, Pasteur's formula for the vaccine was not yet quite ready for trial when the opportunity arose for this public relations dream that he was, you know, hoping to engineer. Um, so he went forward with the experiment, but used the vaccine formula of his chief rival in vaccine development without telling anybody and pretending that it was his own formula. Mm -hmm. And that guy died penniless. And Pasteur went on to become the most famous creator of vaccines in the history of science. Such is science, though, right? He is an operator. He is a really shrewd character, um, which is not to say that he was not also a genius. But, um, you know, he was in some ways an inventor of what we would call modern biotechnology, I would say, including all of the money manipulation that goes into the modern biotech industry. Mm. Perhaps that's, what yeah. I, perhaps that's what I see in that room, actually, is sort of a group of people who are, if we took that idea of the origin of life in the sense of um, a bit more abstract, is a group of people who are quite hesitant. Everyone else is going full steam ahead with one idea, and this group is saying, um, sorry, oh, you still, <laughs> this group is saying, uh, you know, this might be the reason, but we might need to look at it in a different way. Um, because, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Einstein in relation to the nuclear bomb. Um, I recently finished 
the new biography of John von Neumann. And it's interesting to see Einstein is sort of just, he's tiptoeing and being very coy this whole time. And he's really on the fringes. And at this point, I mean, he did, he's reluctant, if, if I understand it right, he's at this point, he's also reluctant to, to make the shift from classical to quantum as well. So he's sort of on the fringes, trying to defend things, but also not really wanting to go the whole way. And so this, this room is of people, it seems to me, who are saying, look, all right, the, that, that theory might be right, but not in the way that you think. And everyone else is going full steam ahead with a new technology yeah. or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be. Right. And all, all these people are pretty um, pretty potent in their personalities, I would say. So I think it's going to be a pretty lively room as well. <laughs> yeah, they have strong personalities. I think that's something that always or almost always goes with that kind of success as scientists, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a sharp-elbowed profession. And I think it's gotten more so as it's gotten more competitive and, you know, more expensive. Mm. Well, hopefully some of these might even might even come in as we move forward. But I want to begin with uh, I want to begin with energy, I guess, because this is, you know, I mean, this is I'll, I'll give, I guess, for listeners who don't know Reich's work, I can only really give the most basic overview. But but I guess very quickly put, when you experience trauma, it gets and this is rough and abstract. It gets drawn into your body and you have, you could say, blockages at certain points. And if you do certain things with your body, the sort of congealed trauma or psychological problems are there is a there is a body mind connection. And the split there for Reich would be wouldn't necessarily be Cartesian. It wouldn't be as clear cut, I don't think. But in doing things with the body with a certain amount of physiological energy, you also release the mental traumatic response, which is caught in your body somewhere. Um, now, you actually begin your understanding of Reich scientifically by saying, look, this is an understanding of energy. This is an understanding of how energy works. Entropy, neg entropy is, and basically this is the question I begin with is, is Reich's understanding of how energy is working in this sense actually scientifically correct? There's a big part of that question that is still an open question waiting for the scientific community to actually pass meaningful judgment on if somebody will seriously replicate some of these experiments. But there's another part of the question, I think, that is that's already pretty well you know, understood. Um, it depends on what scientist you ask. Um, you know, I imagine that you had an abusive father and you were constantly afraid of him coming up and hitting you over the head from behind. It's not mysterious or surprising that you develop this like very clenched shoulders and neck, constantly anticipating a blow from behind, um, just to use one rather graphic example. Um, and after you walk around like that for enough years, you don't realize you're doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. Reich is one of the first people who understood just sort of empirically in the process of working with patients in therapy that the talk therapy of psychoanalysis was very limited in its ability to reach many of those patients. And he was more of an explorer in terms of technique than many of the other psychoanalysts of his generation. Um, and Freud looked upon him as probably the most brilliant clinician of that younger generation because he understood the theory really well, but he also understood if we're not curing our patients, we need to be trying things differently. And um, he's the first one to come across this idea or to, to see that the, the way that the, the person is carrying their body physically, the kind of facial expression that they walk into a therapy session with can sometimes tell you a lot more about what's going on than whatever words they might produce in free association. And um, he begins to break the cardinal rule of psychoanalysis of always having your back to the patient because he begins to realize that there's a lot more being communicated here non-verbally that is more productive to pay attention to, more likely to be directly or closer to the center of this person's problem than whatever they produce in terms of word language. In fact, I mean, like Freud, he suspected that word language was often deployed as a defense um, to keep 
the patient themselves from even having to come in contact with their suppressed traumatic feelings. And, you know, in the most tentative way, he would start just sort of touching the shoulders of a patient who looked like that and found that in some cases, it would mean that the thing spontaneously relaxed and the patient burst into tears and was sobbing. And that for the first time in a couple of years of therapy, they suddenly remembered the traumatic events from their childhood that he began to see were actually in some meaningful sense stored in that muscular tension. Um, and so he began to direct therapy in a way that he thought the, the neurotic symptoms are fueled by energy that is locked up and bound in a way that prevents it from being discharged in a normal, healthy way. And that uh, that was his understanding of what well, the most basic thing that was going on in neurosis. He, he relied heavily on that analogy that Freud used to use that um, in, a, in a normal, healthy patient, um, their body energy was like a stream that was flowing freely. And if there was something, a trauma from childhood, it represented a dam that was somehow built across that stream, an obstacle that prevented it from flowing normally in the way that it, it did before the trauma happened. And the result was that from behind the dam, little rivulets were squirting off to one side and the other and occupying these channels that never would have been occupied. Freud called the water libido, and he wasn't really quite sure what it was, whether it was energy, although that was a big thing because everybody at the turn of the 20th century was really interested in the conservation of energy principle. Um, but at other times he talked about modern hormone research and speculated that it might be some kind of a chemical substance that was building up in the body and accumulated in unnecessarily large amounts under neurotic circumstances. He was never 100% clear exactly what libido was. And I'm not 100% clear whether it moved for Freud in his mind out of the realm of a concept that was useful for heuristic purposes to something that he actually believed was a real something that you could somehow go into a laboratory and measure. Mm -hmm. But Reich began to believe that the opposition to psychoanalysis was never going to yield until somebody proved in a laboratory that Freud's ideas were real and could be um, validated by modern laboratory science. That you could go into a laboratory, for example, and study people in different states of emotion and demonstrate that something was moving in the body and was present in greater amounts under some states of emotion and lesser amounts under others. Um, until that happened, Reich thought psychoanalysis was never really going to be accepted as a science. Um, so that was something already by the late 1920s that was kind of forming in his mind, the idea of trying to figure out what is it exactly that's bound up in these muscular tensions and that gets released when somehow some kind of experience, like in therapy, um, causes those tensions to get released. Um, and, and not only is it that whatever the libido that's bound up is, but out also come pouring the memories that are also somehow bound up in the, he called it muscular armor. Um, but uh, it's related in some ways to another line of thinking of his. He understood fairly early on that there was a common theme in the in the patients that he was seeing with neurotic problems, that there was something all, always disrupted about their sexual life. Mm -hmm. And that um, at first he thought it was just something very straightforward, like here's a person who has never had a normal sexual relationship and always, if they do anything at all, it's just they discharge by masturbating. Um, he later came to have a more nuanced view. Um, he thought that, that 
what that meant was that the libido was in its most direct expression seen in sexual excitation and that the thing you could really see clearly that it wasn't getting discharged in people who had an abnormal sexual life. Um, and he went to Freud and the other analysts and said, you know, like, I, I, I really think that what the problem is here is that these people are incapable of or just never experiencing a, a genuine discharge, a, an actual orgasm where the built up libido is discharged. And most of the older analysts just sort of sneered and said, like, listen, young upstart, um, I have plenty of patients who have sex all the time, like they're even Don Juan types, you know, who brag about how much sex they have. And they're in incredibly neurotic. You are on the wrong track, young man. Um, he doesn't give up his idea in response to that. He goes back and starts asking his patients in much greater detail about their sex lives. And he learns that even the people who say, yeah, I have sex all the time or whatnot. Um, if you ask them more closely about the details about it, it turns out, yeah, but they never experience any pleasure in it. It's like an act of conquest or something like that. Um, or one woman, um, oh, yeah, I masturbate 10 times a day, but she masturbates with a knife, a kitchen knife. And he, the more in detail he asks people about their sex lives, the more he realizes, oh, M.G. <laughs> uh, I know I'm a little out of date there, but um, I, when I'm texting with my kids, um, this I'm, we've been missing the boat here. Orgasm is not what we thought it was. It's not just like, did you have sex and did you come? It's most of the time that that's happening to people, at least people who have a lot of neurotic symptoms, they're not actually having orgasm. They're like something is happening, but the energy is not getting discharged. And he begins to see that the people who actually start getting better through therapy are the people who, A, start to have some kind of a regular sexual life, and B, say, it actually gives them pleasure. And more and more, as they feel like the therapy is helping them, and they're no longer as controlled as they used to be by their obsessive ideas or whatever their particular symptoms were, they experience more and more actual pleasure in the act. And he he tries to capture this in a concept that he calls orgastic potency. And, and the whole idea is, you know, orgasm is not just what you think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just about having sex all the time. It's about whenever you have sex, is there actually a genuine discharge of the built up libido? And from very early on, he is leaning toward the idea that it's chemical or excuse me, that it's energetic mm -hmm. and that it's not chemical. It's a hunch. I, I don't think he would claim that he has any proof for that. And he does read heavily in the literature, both in bioelectricity and in um, biochemistry, trying to pursue both ideas. But he starts thinking in terms of energy. That the, the libido, the thing that's dammed up and that's not getting discharged when there are neurotic symptoms and that is getting discharged when those symptoms suddenly lose all the energy that made them go is, is some kind of energy, mm -hmm. um, something that should be able to be measured in a laboratory. Um, and, and I go on in my book to explain how by about 1934, he reaches the point where he's actually going to go into a laboratory and try to figure out how to measure it. Mm -hmm. And he's offered space in a laboratory at the University of Oslo in Norway in order to try to carry out these experiments. Mm -hmm. So um, your question, is his idea about energy scientifically correct? Uh, there's a huge profession now called body psychotherapy. <laughs> Many thousands of practitioners around the world 
many of whom have never heard the name Wilhelm Reich, but who have absorbed this idea that was one of the most important innovations in therapy that um, rigid, bound up muscular tensions are a crucial part of what keeps the patient's suppressed emotions and suppressed trauma from ever being expressed and resolved. Um, I think that some people are a little more careless than others about how to deal with this situation. Um, and a lot of people might get harmed in the process. Reich was really adamant that nobody should practice his kind of therapy if they didn't have an MD and understand fully kind of physiological dangers that you might put a person in by suddenly just provoking them to discharge these very powerful pent up feelings. But um, I mean, the therapy has sort of proved its merit many times over. There is something that is bound up in what Reich called muscular armor, that when it is released, um, helps people, even people with sometimes very serious problems, uh, function much better and and feel much happier in their life. Um, whether it was exactly what Reich thought it was that was bound up and being released, that's the part that I'm sort of saying at the beginning. Um, I'm still waiting for science to weigh in on this. And this is a catch-22. Mm -hmm. Once something like Reich's work gets widely labeled and regarded as pseudoscience, who's ever going to go back and spend the time looking at it to find out, was there anything of substance to it? And if there was, was Reich's interpretation of it correct? Or would we give it a different interpretation now, but still be glad that we understand that something important here is going on that we didn't know about? Um, you know, I I was hoping that my book would reach a lot of biologists. I mean, I think you detected that it's written at a sort of a <laughs> an ambivalent level because mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach many different audiences, mm -hmm. professional historians of science, but also professional biologists and also a much wider audience um, who has to be patient and slog through the technical sections. But um, I get emails from young biologists who read the book and say, this is absolutely fascinating. I would love to do these experiments. However, I'm quite sure that the boss who runs my laboratory would fire me tomorrow if I did this, or would look at me differently and say, you're not as smart as I thought you were if I even suggested doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big problem. Um, it, th there's certainly something going on here and Reich was onto something important, but what it means is something I think that still needs more research in order to understand it. Was Reich right that it is a new previously unknown form of energy as he came to think after 1939? Uh, what he called orgone energy that i think is an open question and if anybody took Reich seriously that is the question that most needs to be answered mm -hmm. just jumping back to something you said i mean the the, the that difference between orgastic potency for Reich, that sort of serious and just having sex all the time the, yeah the difference between that and i guess the genital orgasm or just you know what however you want to define it this to me is a clear uh some some evidence that actually people aren't really reading right they're just still abiding by the stereotype that's given of him of that was given in the day of the idea like oh this guy's saying that if you masturbate like it's going to cure all our problems because this is this the guy me, who says if you have sex all the time yeah you'll never it, have any health problems this to me also makes it clear a lot of people say uh reich is the the cause for the 1960s sexual revolution and in my opinion the sexual revolution of the 1960s is quite li literally the antithesis of what Reich would have wanted, because that's all about that's all about literally, I guess we could call it free. Free like, fucking, right? Yeah, free fucking, I mean... free like just just go. But, there's, the, but the, the fact that it hasn't sort of solved itself and it keeps accelerating shows that there isn't any releases happening. And Reich would look at it now and think this is really this is damaging. I personally I personally think that was my own reading is that's nothing to do with Reich's sexual revolution. 
I think you're exactly right. I mean, at least uh, that's how I read Reich. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of people only read secondary sources and don't bother to read Reich. Or if they read Reich, they completely miss the significance of this very basic. I mean, this is like the most basic mm -hmm. concept. If you don't understand orgastic potency and it doesn't make sense to you or you don't believe that he's really proven that it's true, then nothing else he says after that is going to make sense to you mm -hmm. because it's absolutely central to his entire research agenda from that point forward that, you know, it's not just about having sex all the time, but how many times do you read an article about Reich? Then the very first sentence is, yeah, the prophet of sexuality who said this, you know, just fucking as much as you can is what will cure all your problems. And that he would be horrified mm -hmm. to hear something like that. I think he was already hearing in his lifetime and he was already horrified. But when somebody says that, it shows that they have absolutely misunderstood everything from square one. Mm -hmm. He looked at those Don Juan types and he said, you know, the idea that somebody would just keep doing it again and again and again is the most basic proof that there is that they're not getting any discharge. And that they're still desperately trying to get discharge. And I think he would say the same thing about a lot of the sexual revolution, that it just demonstrates that um, people are not getting into their depth and getting the real genuine obstacles out of the way that would allow them to experience really complete gratification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? In terms of your own, the, the science in your own books, this all begins with something which really isn't... People know, people, if they've heard of Reich, will know about the orgones, and they'll know about orgone accumulators, but the bion experiments is where it begins, and that doesn't really get much of a look in anymore. It's people just talk about organs. So we begin, yeah, and we there's begin two, with the bions. <laughs> there's two reasons why I think you have to begin with the bions. I mean, first... It's in one particular kind of culture of bions that he thinks he has actually discovered a new, previously unknown kind of energy that he decides to call orgone energy. And secondly, because it's these bion experiments that end up leading him to a, a very unorthodox and very different theory about the origin of cancer and um, leads him to a whole series of experiments in trying to develop a, a cancer therapy based on this very different understanding of how cancer cells originate. Um, so, I mean, if there was anybody who wanted to salvage something from Reich's work, this is, these are, these experiments are key, I think, to trying to decide whether or not you think there's substance to everything that comes after. I mean, either orgone energy is discovered here and you can show that it exists or you can't. Mm. Um, and either you can show that inside the body under certain conditions, things like these things he calls bions form and clump together into cancer cells, or they don't. And, um, you know, I think that it's it, in both cases, the experiments are really decisive for trying to evaluate whether or not outside of therapy, I mean, I think the value of his work in therapy is well established. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, of course, something that psychologists and physicists, or rather physicists and biologists are unlikely to weigh in on. But um, whether or not his discoveries and innovations in therapy have implications for physical health and disease, and whether he's correct about the implications they have for the origin of life, that requires laboratory replication of the experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing that, to only the very slightest extent, has been done. So, so a bion is the, metaphorically speaking, like sort of the atomic stuff of this, of the, uh, the stuck energy. Would that be correct? Um, well, he thinks that any kind of matter not just organic matter from a living organism. And if it wasn't a living organism, it wouldn't have to be like armored tissue mm -hmm. that has energy stuck in it. I mean, he thinks that like Einstein, I mean, matter and energy are interchangeable and that therefore matter is in some ways bound to energy. 
and that under the right circumstances, the, the matter can break down in a way that liberates some of that energy so that it is now free energy instead of bound in, you know, in the form of matter. And what he thinks he's discovered in the Bion experiments is that some kinds of matter, that energy can be liberated um, just by swelling in water or in a solution that has something like a potassium salt in it. Uh, potassium salts tend to accelerate swelling. Mm. Um, they make tissues take up water in greater amounts. Um, and you can speed that process along by heating or putting it under pressure or both, uh, like you would in an autoclave, which is usually used as a sterilizing device. But Reich found that if you autoclave a lot of different kinds of materials, not only when you look at them immediately afterwards under a microscope, not only do you see no microbial activity, you see a tremendous amount of movement and activity. These things that he called bions are not bacteria, though they're about the same size. Um, and there's some kind of relationship there, but that was not 100% clear in his research. Um, but uh, some kinds of matter that are, you, you might even be more surprised, not organic at all, sand, iron, um, pumice from lava. Um, he found that you, you'd have to soak that in water for a thousand years, even if you were boiling it and putting it under steam pressure before it broke down into these little bacteria sized vesicles that he called bions. But he thought, if I, really want to convince people that what these bions are is not some kind of bacteria that got into the mixture from the air. Well, what if I try heating this stuff to, heating it to like incandescence in a Bunsen burner flame and then putting it into an autoclave solution that's already been sterilized according to hospital standards of sterility. And he found that even something really inorganic like iron filings or sand um carbon pure carbon filings uh would break down into bions pretty rapidly if you heated it to incandescence and then let it swell in a sterilized fluid and would produce bions again that look pretty similar to the ones that came from other sources like organic matter animal tissues or plant tissues that had been soaked in in some kind of a solution, a potassium solution, usually. Um, and he began to think that the, the, the process of matter breaking down into bions was something that must be going on in nature all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it might be very slow under some circumstances, but um, he read a famous book by a Swedish chemist, uh, Svante Arrhenius, uh, called The Worlds in the Making. Uh, was really probably one of the most widely read popular science books of the early 20th century. And Arrhenius speculates a lot about the early history of planets when they first form mm -hmm. and how at first the whole surface of the planet would be incandescent and only gradually would it cool. And the light bulb goes on over his head and he says, oh my God, he's talking about on the scale of a whole planet doing an experiment like the one that I just did mm. with some pulverized lava in a test tube, you know, after heating it in a Bunsen burner flame. It must be that this is how life first originates on planets. As their surface is cool and water, uh, liquid water becomes available when it comes in contact with incandescent material that is dissolving into bions because of the contact with the water. Um, these bions, if he watched them long enough, um, would take on a lot of properties like living things. So, for example, you could transfer them to a sterile culture medium and a new generation of them would grow up there. You could transfer them from sterile medium to sterile medium again and again and again and get 30 new generations of bions from the same one. They were in some way reproducing themselves in sterile culture media. Are we still on? Yeah. 
oh, okay. Somehow I'm not seeing the um, the image and I wonder what happened to it. Mm. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, he also found that um, they would take up biological stains the way bacteria do. Um, so you, I mean, many times bacteria are classified by which biological stains they take up and which ones they don't. Um, tuberculosis bacteria and others in that genus um, stain in a process called acid fast staining, but other genera of bacteria don't respond to that stain. Um, but all bacteria basically with another procedure called a gram stain will either end up staining red or blue depending on, and, and so biological or rather uh, 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 the, the classification system for bacteria for a long time was based on, okay, here's the very first cut. Is it gram positive or is it gram negative? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of disease organisms turn out to be gram negative, though that's not to say that there's not plenty that are also gram positive. Mm -hmm. um, so they looked like they had an awful lot of properties of microorganisms and like they might be some kind of intermediate stage between non-living matter and fully living matter like a tumor um uh, so this is what i meant when i said a little while ago that uh the experiments have pretty profound implications for what you think about how life originates especially on planets where it's capable of originating and reich would have thought that if these kind of intermediate stages can come from the dissolving of almost any kind of matter under the right conditions then life must be pretty ubiquitous throughout the universe but at times, it seemed that the bions would become more complex. Um, they, they seem most of the time like these little tiny vesicles that are, as I said, about the size of bacteria, um, but, but never get particularly complex and don't look to be even as complex as a bacterial cell is. Um, but other times they clump together and a membrane forms around them. And he particularly saw this happen in the first instance when he was looking at plant tissue disintegrating in water. And he discovered that if he used uh, grass, for example, that was cut in the spring, when it was really fresh and green, it would not break down into bions. Or if it did, it would take a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. Whereas if he used dead grass that was cut in the fall, after it was already dying or completely dead, it would break down into bions much more rapidly. You could literally watch it under the microscope over the course of a few days. Or if you didn't want to stand at a microscope for hours and hours for days on end, he developed a time-lapse filming apparatus to watch it, you know, in speed it up fashion with time-lapse. But uh, he had a hunch that this might have something to do with the energy having been lost by the tissues when they died or were dying. And he started to ask for samples of tissue from cancer patients at a nearby cancer hospital on a hunch that if something like this could happen in plant tissues, then what would happen in the tissues of a person who had been sick with whatever the underlying process was that took a long time to generate cancer. And he's, when he looked at the tissues from cancer patients under the microscope and used the same time-lapse technique, he saw something that was really strikingly parallel. Normal healthy cells would degenerate, break down into these bions. The bions would clump together, a membrane would form around the clump, and then it would move off and start swimming along as an independent creature. And if at that point you looked at the thing, in a plant, it looked like an amoeba. But the, the membrane-bounded clumps of bions that swam away from disintegrating an animal tissue looked just like a photograph in a book of a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. And he thought, this is how cancer cells originate. And that it's not about some kind of multiplication process going astray, as mainstream research thinks. It's about something that deprives the tissues of their energy so that they start to die 
even while inside an organism that's still alive. And that over years, that would lead them to be breaking down into bions, these clumps of bions forming, and those would be independent cancer cells that could wander through the tissues and eventually become the cells that are the seed of a tumor starting to develop. Um, so that's another reason why I think that these bion experiments are um, important to look at. Um, if there's anything to Reich's later work with cancer, um, it all hinges on this model of how the cancer cell develops that he observed in the microscope and the time-lapse films that he made of these processes are still there in Reich's archives and you, know, you can see them. So you can see that he's not making this up. The process does take place as he described it. Now, does that mean that that's actually the main way that cancer cells form? I am not a cancer biologist. Um, sometimes wish I was, because I would love to know the answer to that question. Um, but it certainly does seem to be the way that some cells form that look an awful lot like cancer cells. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a and it's a really potentially medically important part of the discovery, if there's anything to it. Um, which again is why I was sort of inviting young biologists. Hey, don't you think this sounds like somebody would be well rewarded to go back and look at these experiments again? But it's really hard for a young biologist to do. Mm. Really risky for their career. Mm. How does that develop through then into the the organ? Ah, so um, there's one particular culture of bions. Um, uh, I say, you know, after he creates a type of bion, he starts to inoculate it into sterile culture media to see if it will reproduce and create a pure culture of itself. And he had many different types of bions. One of them, um, which was made from sand that had been heated to incandescence in a Bunsen burner flame. Um, when he studied it for several weeks on end, um, the, the bions were, they had a bright field around them um, that was really novel. It was different from any of the other types he had seen. And after a few weeks, he got really inflamed, irritated eyes. And he went to an ophthalmologist who said, if you've been looking at something in a microscope that's making your eyes irritated, stop looking at it. That's the solution. Um, and he, you know, he stops for a few days and his eyes start to get a little bit better, but he's, he thinks this is something important. So he puts it under a microscope with only one ocular mm -hmm. and just looks through one eye and that eye gets inflamed, but the other one continues to get better. Mm -hmm. He's, starts looking at them with sunglasses through the microscope and they're not his eyes are not nearly as inflamed he's like there's something these are giving off some kind of radiation um you know the way you would have your eyes react if you were staring into the sun for too long or something like that um he takes a a slide with a drop of the bion culture on it and puts it on his skin and leaves it there for a few minutes and takes it away and nothing happened. But then he does the same thing with a slide that's made out of quartz instead of glass. And when he takes it away after it's been on his skin for five or 10 minutes, the circle underneath where the bion culture was, the drop of fluid on the slide is red on his skin. It, his skin is sunburned in the area where the bions were sitting. Um, and he, uh, quartz is transparent to ultraviolet. Mm. Uh, glass is not, which is why if you're sitting in your car with the window rolled up, you won't get a sunburn. But if your windows were made out of quartz, you would get a sunburn. Mm -hmm. And he knows this from previous experiments on other matters that if you have a hunch that it is a radiation and you think that it might be in the wavelengths of ultraviolet, then try doing it with a quartz slide. Um, there's it bion cultures that are left sitting near photographic film plates fog the film 
even if the film is in its cardboard wrapper and has not been opened. Um, and there's a number of different things like this that lead him to believe that these bions are giving off some kind of radiation. And he asked for advice from a physicist in Holland who somebody who's written to him having read his previous book about the bion experiments. And this guy sort of talks him through a number of different possible experiments you can do to try to identify what is this radiation. Take it into a dark room and see whether or not there's any visual manifestations. If it's like alpha particles, you can see little streaks zipping out from things in a dark room. Um, I mean, fortunately for him, the last 30 years, there's been a lot of radiation research. So um, uh, uh, quite a few techniques have been developed and he tries pretty much all of them. And he concludes that uh, the properties of this radiation, I mean, it shares some things in common with electromagnetic radiation, but in other ways, it's quite different. Um, and that's when he decides, I, I've discovered some new kind of energy. And because he's had the previous experience with the bion experiments generally of thinking that the energy in these bions is a more basic kind of energy that's common to all living organisms. His, his hunch or his hypothesis is that what I've discovered here is a, a specific biological energy. This was a theory that back around 1910, 1915 was a sort of a, I wouldn't say popular, but there was a significant minority of biologists back around 1910, 1915, including one of his professors at the University of Vienna Medical School, who were advocates of this idea that what made living things different was not some kind of mysterious vital force. It was a kind of genuine natural energy that was like heat and light and electromagnetism. It was interchangeable through conservation principles with any other form of energy. But there was something about it that was the specific form of energy for living things. Um, and he had sort of hung on to that hypothesis or took it seriously enough that that was the first hypothesis that came to him to explain what he was seeing. Um, and that's when he began to try to develop more thorough ways to study the energy that the bions were giving off. Um, he, one of the most remarkable observations that really struck him almost immediately was he put these bions on a microscope slide next to other kinds of things to see if there was any reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, well, what does this radiation do to other things? And one of the things that he tried putting next to them on a microscope slide was cancer cells from a tumor tissue that he had gotten from a hospital. So their cancer cells were still alive. Um, and when they got anywhere within a few micrometers of these bions that had the radiation, they were paralyzed and killed. And that's where he starts to get the idea. Could this somehow be turned into a cancer therapy? Could there be, could I figure out some way? I mean, could I inject these bions into it? And he tries injecting them into experimental mice that have cancer tumors and finds that in many of the mice, not all, but many of them, the tumor shrinks dramatically as a result of the bion injections. Some of them appear to die from side effects of some foreign matter being injected into them. But when he does a significant study with about 200 mice, the all cancer mice that he gets from a laboratory that breeds cancer mice who have, have spontaneous tumors, um, the mice that he has given these bion injections to live significantly longer statistically than control group that was not given bion injections or was just given saline injections. Um, so he begins to think there might be the possibility here for some kind of a cancer therapy. Um, and uh, there's a whole separate set of experiments that tries where he's trying to figure out how can I isolate the radiation from these bions in order to be able to study it more closely? And one of the sort of standard experiments that people do 
with radiation, um, especially by the 1930s when there's a lot of electromagnetic fields around after the use of electricity has become really widespread, you discover some new form of what might be electromagnetic radiation. And in order to study it, you have to somehow isolate it from the surrounding electromagnetic fields, from radio transmissions and you know power lines, and there's electromagnetic fields everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that had already been discovered back in the 19th century by uh, the British physicist Michael Faraday was that you could isolate an electromagnetic phenomenon from the electromagnetic fields around it by putting it in a metal enclosure. Mm. And it didn't even have to be solid metal. It could just be like a cage made out of screening, mm. metal screening. But when you put some kind of a measuring device inside a cage like that, it would not measure the surrounding electromagnetic fields. They were blocked. Um, I don't know if you ever drive across metal truss bridges where there's a big metal superstructure that makes up the whole bridge. They don't make them that much anymore now that structural steel has gotten strong enough to make long spans without having a big overarching truss. But mm -hmm. if you drive over these old truss bridges, a radio signal fades out when you're in the middle of the bridge because you're in something like a Faraday cage when you're when you're crossing a bridge like that. And he, uh, he he's seen in a dark room that there are visual manifestations to it. Um, so he surrounds the Faraday cage with a layer of some, you know, like cardboard or something like that. So it's dark. And if you put a like a magnifying lens in a hole in one wall, you can look into this cage. Inside, you can put one of the bion cultures and you can see radiation effects that you know are just from that kind of radiation, not from any external electromagnetic fields. And um, that is what later comes to be called the orgon energy accumulator, the metal on the inside with a layer of some kind of non-metallic material, some kind of insulator around it, um, because he's very puzzled that when he takes the cultures out of the cage with the surrounding darkening material and he looks through the lens, some of the manifestations of the radiation are still present in the cage, even though the culture is no longer there. <clears throat> it's not as strong as it was when the cultures were in there, but there's specific little visual sort of streaks and dots and um, little bright things moving in a spiral sort of path that are still visible in there. He puzzles over this for a while, but um, eventually he thinks he's seeing the same thing. Um, he, he goes on a vacation to a very dark part of Western Maine um, the very first summer after he's in the United States. A friend says to him, I have a cabin up in the middle of nowhere. You'll love it. You're under a lot of stress and you need to just go and get away from everything for a little while. And it's so dark up there that uh, darker than anything he's ever seen before. And uh, he takes a tube with a magnifying lens in it. And it's just sort of looking up at the sky to see what he can see. And in between the stars, he sees these same kind of streaks and dots and little spiral paths, shiny things that he saw from the Bion cultures in the dark room mm -hmm. and even in the surrounded Faraday cage after the Bion cultures have been removed. And his hypothesis is, oh, I get it. This is some kind of energy that's present in the Earth's atmosphere, not just in living things. And that what I'm the reason I'm seeing it still in the Faraday cage with the non-metallic material around it is because there's something about metals that are attracting it from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so he starts to do some physics experiments with the energy from the radiation from the bion cultures and discovers that if you put metallic material near them, it's attracted strongly 
to something that's radiating this energy like these bions. But then after a minute, it's pushed away, repelled. If you take something that is uh, an insulator, a non-metallic material, um, it's not attracted to the energy, but it absorbs it. And if you then take that material over to an electroscope, it will register a charge up the electroscope that it didn't have before from the energy that it has absorbed from the radiation. So his hypothesis to explain what's going on in the box is the organic material or the insulating material on the outside is absorbing the energy from the atmosphere. And then the metallic material is absorbing it, but then quickly re repelling it. And some of what it's repelling goes back into the outer organic layer. And some of what it's repelling is going to the center of the box. Mm. And what, 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 what it repelled back toward the organic layer is going to again get attracted to the metal. And at least some of it is going to end up being repelled toward the center of the box. So um, he thinks that this is a kind of energy that exists in the atmosphere as well as in living organisms. He takes this, this box that he now thinks is what he calls an orgone energy accumulator and uses that to treat the cancer mice. Mm -hmm. He repeats the experiment he did with the bion injections to see if it will prolong the lifespan of the cancer mice and says, oh, I mean, if I can deliver the radiation to them this way, it will be so much simpler. And I won't see a whole bunch of them die from the side effects of having some foreign matter injected into them. And if you look at the data from the laboratory notebooks, again, with like 200 mice, um, statistically, the mice that are treated in these orgone energy accumulators live longer than the mice that are not treated that way or that are just put in a dummy box each day that doesn't have the alternate metal and non-metal layers. Um, you can't actually tell the difference statistically between the extension of the lifespan from the bion injections compared to the accumulator, it looks like it's a little better with the accumulator than it was with the bions, but statistically, it's not a significant difference. Um, but uh, both of the treatments definitely statistically significantly extend the lifespan of cancer mice. They die in the end, mm. but they live longer mm. before they die. And he this is when he begins to think, uh, maybe we're ready to try this on some human volunteers, if we could find any. And uh, people who have been in therapy with him and who hear about these experiments start saying to him, oh, my sister has a tumor and has been told that she has only three months to live. Would you be willing to blah, blah, blah? And you know, after he gets enough data from the mice, he reaches the point where he says, all right, here's what we will do. I mean, if, if a person wants to try this, they have to sign an affidavit that says, I understand that this is completely experimental. I'm not being promised anything. I'm not paying any money because this is completely just pure research. Um, and about two dozen people end up volunteering for these experiments he his criterion is somebody who's been told by their doctor yes you definitely have a tumor and yes you have less than one year to live mm -hmm. um, because he that's where he hopes it will be possible to see so far what he's seen is it seems to prolong lifespan mm -hmm. and he hasn't you know um, I should back up a little uh, to say that in the mice experiments um, some of the mice died not from their tumors. Some of the mice in those experiments, he did an autopsy on every one of the experimental mice afterward. And some of them died before their tumor would have killed them, uh, especially the ones in whom the tumors appeared to be shrinking the most dramatically. And that might seem kind of paradoxical because you'd think those would be the ones whose lifespan was extended the most. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, 
what happened was that the tumors were broken apart and the detritus from the destroyed tumor was circulating in the body and the excretory organs, the kidneys, the liver, the spleen would get clogged up and overwhelmed trying to get rid of the detritus from the destroyed tumor. And many of the experimental mice would die of kidney failure because of this, the ones where the tumor had been most thoroughly destroyed, their excretory organs were just overwhelmed and unable to get rid of the material from the destroyed tumor. Um, all of this Reich publishes in the course of the experiments. And similarly with a number of the human patients, um, he sees tumors shrink dramatically in size. He sees their blood picture improve markedly, improved hemoglobin levels. Um, and he's measuring a number of different parameters about the blood that all seem to be getting better. And then the ones in whom the tumors are destroyed the most rapidly end up dying of kidney failure. And he says, okay, I think I know what's going on here. I've seen this happen in the mice. Um, and all of this, again, is published in his published case histories of, of what happens in these cases. Um, that material was all collected eventually into a single volume, the, his book called The Cancer Biopathy. But the case histories were initially published over the course of several years as the work was taking place. Um, this is one of the things that to me is makes Reich's story the most puzzling. He makes absolutely clear that in the end, not only do all the experimental mice die, but all of the human volunteers die. Mm. It's not always from their tumor. In the case of the human vol volunteers, he's only got an N of like 24 or 25. That's not enough to do meaningful statistics on. Mm. But anecdotally, it does appear that most of them live longer than their doctors had given them. So he thinks, you know, there's something powerfully biologically going on here. But how it can be that anybody interprets what he's publishing as, I have found a cure for cancer, is baffling. When he so clearly reports, every one of the patients died. Hmm. Um, it's, it's just baffling. It's partly because a journalist who publishes a sort of an expose article about his work somebody who's used to writing for consumer reports and thinks of herself as a sort of a consumer protection journalist mm. thinks, you know, this can't possibly be true. This is, this is crazy. And publishes an article in 1947 saying this guy is claiming to cure cancer. And that article is sent to the food and drug administration who set about trying to investigate, right. It's, it's not clear how carefully they actually read Reich's published accounts of the cases. <laughs> and it is hard to understand if they did read them carefully, how they could take seriously this complete misrepresentation that he was somehow claiming to cure cancer. I mean, in the end, this is, you know, essentially the whole, the whole substance behind the FDA's case against him. It's not the specific charge for which he was sent to prison. But the whole case would never have started without this claim. Mm. And it, the claim is ludicrous on the face of it. And it's really hard to understand um, how a justice system could proceed in this way against somebody when the entire claim at the very beginning of the whole thing is patently ludicrous. Um, but somebody published it somewhere. And if it's in print, it must be true. I saw it on the internet. It must be true. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we've gone somewhat afield of your last question, but no, I, think, I know we were heading towards some of these questions about the cancer experiments. Oh, absolutely. I think I think we, we, we've done the whole the whole trajectory. I mean, we, we can continue our discussion. I mean, just I'll just make sure are you OK for time? Um, yeah, I have perhaps another half hour. OK. Well, one, one thing I wanted to ask, I guess, just on a personal level, have, have you uh, yourself used an organ accumulator or an organ blanket? Is this something that you personally? I, I've tried it because I felt like, you know, 
what's going on here? Is there something to this? And I mean, you know, if you try something personally and you're, you're a scientist, you sort of know from the outset that there's almost nothing you can say. It's it's all pure anecdotal, simple mm-hmm. N equals one kind of information, whatever it is. So it's hard to know what it means. But um, it it's not like sticking your finger in an electric socket. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people back in Reich's time used to say, how could this possibly be anything? It's not even plugged in. Mm. Um, and uh, it, I, I mean, it, it has seemed to me that if I tried it when I felt like I was coming down with the cold, I was less likely to come down with the cold. Mm. Um, but if you wait until you have a cold, it's not going to suddenly cure you of a cold. Um, it's a kind of a subtle thing. If it's if it's doing something, it's very subtle. Mm. Um, and it's something where it does what it does because you use it every day for an extended period of time, mm. not because you wait until you're already sick and then try to sit on it. Um, but uh, again, I mean, this is the kind of thing where you would need, you'd really need a double blind, statistically controlled study. Um, at one point, there was a study like this being planned by Reich's trust. Um, when he died in his will, uh, a trust was created that had the duty of trying to preserve his work. Um, and uh, at one point, they were trying to design a, a, a large scale study. One of the things that the orgone accumulator most surprisingly seemed to have an effect on was healing burns more rapidly than they would heal without using an accumulator. And uh, it seemed to be one of the more dramatic features. Um, Testing it on cancer is complicated, Mm. right? Reich suggested, well, you could get a city of 10,000 people and you could have an accumulator in half of the houses and no accumulator in the other half of the houses. But otherwise, let the city go on just as it normally did so that and that the accumulators would be randomly dispersed so that it would not in any way change other lifestyle factors. Mm -hmm. Same city, same atmosphere, same pollution, same exposure to most other things. but cancer is so complicated and there's so many different kinds of cancer and there's so many other factors involved. Treating burns in an emergency room and carefully measuring the rate of healing of burns would seem to be a much more easily controlled kind of study and probably a lot cheaper. And at one point, the head of a major emergency medicine department at an American medical school that I am not allowed, uh, according to him, to publicize the people, was interested in doing this and said, I am the head of the emergency medicine department. We see 2,000, 2,500 burn cases a year come into our emergency room. It would be the easiest thing in the world to randomly assort them as they come in to standard treatment or standard treatment plus accumulator. Mm -hmm and see whether or not the burns healed faster in patients who were getting, you know, you'd have to have standard treatment. You couldn't do nothing because that's, you know, unethical and you'd never get that past a review board. But um, standard treatment plus accumulator might conceivably make some measurable difference. Um, I don't know exactly how far they got in the process, but I do know I talked to this guy at one point and he said, uh, yeah, you know, it got to the point where I had to bail because when my supervisors found out about this, they said, you are not going to do this here. <laughs> we will be the laughing stock of every university medical school in the country, and you are not going to do that to us. And if you want to keep doing this, you're going to do it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And he did not want to lose his job, so he stopped working on it. But it would seem to me like That's not such a complicated project. And his estimate, this was, I don't know, 10, maybe 12 years ago. His estimate was it would cost about a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. 
which is a drop in the bucket mm -hmm. in terms of biomedical research costs. Um, it's not that it couldn't be tested. It's that nobody takes it seriously enough to try to test it. Mm -hmm. It's a catch-22. Mm -hmm. And as long as nobody takes it serious enough to try to test it, the dominant narrative that it's just pseudoscience remains unchallenged. So my book, I was hoping, could be a little sort of a foot in the door to open the door just a crack mm. to make it possible for some biologist somewhere to say, well, look, there is this book from Harvard University Press that said, you know, these experiments were not dismissed because the evidence showed that he was wrong. They were dismissed because he was a Jew and a communist and a, you know, a radical psychoanalyst with radical ideas about sex that made a lot of people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so far, nothing more than a few nibbles. That's a shame. It's a difficult catch-22. It's a shame. Well, I mean, when you hear that, I wouldn't have even thought about publishing a book like this until after I had tenure you get some sense of the scale of the problem. Yeah. And it does, it does seem that the primary problem then is just simply the, the stereotypical idea of, of right just hasn't, hasn't moved at all. No. And, you know, I think the media are complicit in this in a really irresponsible way. Mm. But the irresistible story of the crazy guy with the sex box, they just, they can't leave it alone. And they, media, which are normally quite responsible about doing their due diligence, never go back and read Reich. Hmm. I mean, you know, media that you think of as perfectly responsible still talk about that crazy guy Reich with the sex box who thought that sex would cure everything. Hmm. They've never read, they've clearly never read the primary sources. They're just recycling old rumors without any sense of obligation to hmm. investigate what the facts actually were it's aggravating it's not a difficult read either um some people find him difficult you, you know in the course that i teach at, at an undergraduate level some students think like this is the most arrogant guy i've ever read oh his his emotion his emotion comes through all the time but other students say wow this is like incredible this is it's such a headlong quality to his writing. You just can't put it down. And people respond to this. Reich would have said based on their own character structures, <laughs> at least to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what are you working on now? Have you found the next radical scientist to possibly get you fired from your position to write a book about? Actually, <laughs> um, <laughs> I got so interested in this guy's story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have this basic portfolio that is the history of ideas and experiments about the origin of life. But I've gotten so interested in this guy's story, and especially in the legal case against Reich, mm -hmm. and how it is that the United States government forms the judgment that they ought to burn scientific books in public, um, that I've decided that my next project is a, a scientific biography of Reich's whole career. Wow. Um, and I have to learn a lot about psychoanalysis, obviously, that I don't know. And I probably also have to learn a lot about physics that I don't know for the latter half of his career or the latter maybe 20% of his career. Um, but uh, it's, just, it's, it's a really astonishing career arc. Mm -hmm. And... You know, my first, the monograph that I wrote is only basically five years, 1934 to 1939. Mm -hmm. And it ends even before he starts doing any of the cancer therapy experiments. So um, I think there's, there's really a lot more to be said about this guy. But I would really like the public to think about the burning of the books and to look at I mean, that whole story about how there's no place ever that he uh, says something like, you know, wow, this is going to cure cancer. And yet 
that is essentially the thing that he's raked over the coals for and that is used as the justification for mm. not just censoring the books, throwing them into a fire. Mm -hmm. On the first day of the undergraduate class, I ask students, why do you think that an agency of the United States government and a federal court made the judgment that this was so dangerous, it wasn't even enough to censor it or to withdraw it from circulation. It had to be thrown into a fire. Hmm. This guy who escaped from the Nazis burning his books and came here to have to watch that happen. And of course, these days, undergraduates have no idea who this guy is and they've never heard of him. So uh, they don't have any idea what the answer to that question might be on the first day of class. But I say, uh, we're going to talk about that on the last day of class. Mm -hmm. And I'll be interested to hear what you think or if you have formed any opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it was felt it was so, what about it mm -hmm. made people think no nothing else is good enough except burning it to ashes and that's another annoyance right in terms of the rumors about right people say oh isn't he the, along with the whole sex box thing they say isn't he the guy that went he went paranoid and mad and i think yeah yeah i'd go pa rightfully <laughs> rightfully so right i mean of all the people to, of all the people to be justifiably paranoid you in chased out of country after country <laughs> and you watch two different regimes burn your books and throw you in jail or try to throw you in jail. And yeah, I mean, and then, of course, there's that old bumper sticker, right? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean the world isn't out to get you. <laughs> mm. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was, but that doesn't disprove the fact that, you know, he was chased from country to country, nor does it prove that what the US government did with his books was rational. Um, so, you know, in an age of Trump and DeSantis and book banning, I, it seems to me like this story is more relevant than it has ever been. Um, certainly not less relevant anyway. Um, you, you asked me in the questions that you sent me to mm -hmm. think about beforehand, why was Reich's scientific work attacked? Mm -hmm. I've said a few things like that along the way, but I would like to just toss in a couple more <laughs> um, because, again, these are some of the things that made the story so interesting mm -hmm. to me that I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to invest the time to do an entire scientific biography of this guy, mm -hmm. not just this one set of experiments. Um, in the case of the Food and Drug Administration, there's one very specific thing that's worth mentioning. Um, the sort of not absolutely top tier guy at the organization, but like second tier administrator at the organization who really was the main initiator of the investigation of Reich and the 10 year FDA campaign to try to destroy his work mm -hmm. was a guy named William Wharton. And um, I would recommend to anybody listening to this podcast who wants to know more about the Reich story, and especially the U.S. government's investigation of Reich, the best book on the subject is called Wilhelm Reich versus the USA uh, by Jerome Greenfield. It's out of print from back in the 1970s, but you can surely find a copy of it somewhere on bookfinder.com or in your library. And um, it's extraordinarily good because Greenfield... Uh, was writing at a time when a lot of the people at the FDA who had been involved in the investigation back in the 1940s were still alive. Mm. He could interview quite a few of them. And there were um, oral history interviews done with many of them that went into FDA archives. And that's relevant because they had a lot of things to say about this guy Wharton, who had been their superior and who was the guy that initiated the investigation against Wright. If you look into FDA files, and I've only done the first pass on FDA files about the Reich case so far, it's clear from the outset that they thought what they were doing here was busting some kind of sex racket. And they, they had dirty minds and they could not see a title like the function of the orgasm and not think, oh, we're going to get this guy under some kind of pornography law. 
Mm. Um, and Wharton, it was said in the interviews by a number of former FDA employees who worked under him, had a really unhealthy obsession about sexual matters to the extent that when a female secretary came into his office to take dictation, he would take out of his desk drawer a large ceramic phallus and put it up on the desk and leave it there in front of them the whole time that the woman was sitting there taking dictation from him. That is the guy who initiated the FDA investigation of Reich. And that is no doubt why, from the outset, the FDA investigation of Reich saw this as some kind of sex racket that they were going to break up. Um, no matter what the evidence was about the orgone accumulator, the main reason they focused on the accumulator was because it was being shipped in commerce over interstate lines. Mm -hmm. And they knew that the interstate commerce clause meant that a federal agency could claim jurisdiction over this matter. They could hang their hat on that and it would stick in a court of law. But they didn't think the accumulator, if they thought the accumulator was anything, they thought it was a sex box. Mm. And uh, they clearly never read a word about it that Reich had written, if that's what they believed. So that's why some people <laughs> were critical of Reich's work. I mean, it provoked their own sexual issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it probably still does to this day. Uh, it's a book like The Function of the Orgasm is pretty provocative reading for people who are very anxious or were brought up very conservative about sex. Um, and I think for many people, they might just feel like, this guy's evil. This guy's immoral. There's something wrong with this. Um, they certainly were saying that back in Vienna and Berlin in the 1920s and 30s when he was crusading for legalizing abortion. Mm. Um, but again, I think that's one of the things that makes the story more relevant today than ever, especially in the United States. Um, there, there's also, among some of the scientists who criticized Reich, I think, an element of professional jealousy. It's not the thing that you're necessarily going to find unless you're very lucky in a letter that they wrote to a colleague saying, you know, don't you just wish that guy would have a big come down because he seems to know everything. But you can sense it in the way that people behave toward him. He, Reich is really remarkable in terms of um, I mean, he's, as I said earlier, a very talented clinician. And one of the things that irritated many of the older psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts was that he could sometimes look at a case and see right to the heart of the matter immediately. And a case that they might have been breaking their head over for years, even though they were much older and more established than he was. Mm. And they hated that about him. And each time that he crossed some disciplinary boundary into physiology, into microbiology, into cancer research, into biology, into physics, if you believe that he had this same capability of sort of seeing quickly to the heart of a matter, um, even if it wasn't his main specialty, um, that was really embarrassing to other people who were specialists in those fields, they would probably never say that publicly. But it is impossible not to see that as something that must have happened. Mm -hmm. And I, in my book, I explore one very specific way in which something like this might play out in, when he's working in Oslo, Norway in the 1930s on these experiments. It's the height of the Great Depression big money for expensive biology experiments is really hard to find. There's not yet government support for science on a large scale the way there is after World War II. There's no National Institutes of Health. There's no National Science Foundation. In, in Europe and in the US for biology research in the 1930s, there's only really one pot of money of any size. Mm. 
and it's at a private foundation called the Rockefeller Foundation. And most of the scientists in Norway, which is a pretty small town, Oslo in the late 1930s, know each other. Most of them are colleagues working together. Some of them are getting money from the Rockefeller Foundation. And when Reich begins to see the possibility of a potential for cancer research in his bion experiments, a famous anthropologist, Malinowski, recommends to the Rockefeller Foundation, you should look at this guy's work. I think it might be important because when he has wandered into anthropology, he has seen things that none of us see and he has seen them very quickly. He's a very smart guy. So the Rockefeller Foundation says, tell him to set up, submit a proposal. And he does. And the Rockefeller Foundation is a sort of a small old boy network. Their way of evaluating a proposal is to go around and talk to other scientists who are already in their funding network and ask them, hey, what do you think of this guy's work? <laughs> it's really kind of astonishing when you see the conflict of interest that's involved there especially at the height of the depression when this is the only game in town for money in the life sciences and it's a limited pot of money there's no way that his fellow scientists in oslo are not saying to themselves if he gets more we're going to get less and to a man they all disparage his work and say it's it's nonsense mm -hmm. don't give him a dime and rockefeller foundation turns down his request um, so you know, completely independent of whether they felt any personal jealousy, there's certainly real live competition for a limited pot of money. And I, I can't help but believe that that played into this to some extent. Um, would they ever admit that to themselves consciously? I don't know. Um, but I don't think I have to prove that. Mm -hmm. I think just describing the circumstances makes it pretty clear that uh, that was probably a live issue. Um, there's a lot of anti-Semitism, even among liberals and even among the Socialist Party in Norway. Um, and here comes this foreigner who's a radical, a Jew, a psychoanalyst, drives into town in a bright red sports car with a blonde hanging off his arm. <laughs> And he's written all kinds of offensive ideas about, you know, free love. And um, I don't think any of them understands the concept of orgastic potency. <laughs> um, so I, I just there's so many different ways in which the subject matter that he's working on is too provocative for many people. If religion is involved at all or they take it seriously in their lives. They're going to be offended both by the sexual content and by the idea that he's suggesting a naturalistic origin of life. No supernatural creator necessarily involved. Mm -hmm. um, that was a problem for Pester, too, by the way, um, because he was a serious Catholic. Um, yeah, so, I mean, why did so many people attack Reich's work? I think there's a host of reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in many people, more than one of them was probably an operation. But um, that's a really interesting thing about history of science. And, you know, really why I'm so happy that I was drawn into this field is that it's uh, an invitation to look into all of these things and to try to weigh whatever evidence you can find for, you know, the relative role of all of these things in the process. Um, the one thing that's quite astonishing is that nobody ever bothered to try to replicate the experiments. Mm -hmm. and you they keep, you all said from the beginning, students, keep pushing your students to do it. But as they you, said as from you the said, beginning, you know, this is ridiculous. It can't possibly be true. It's not even worth my wasting my time. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're still saying today. So not because they have any evidence to back that up, but just because somebody said it a long time ago. And everybody has kept saying it since. It's a shame. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think there could be a lot at stake in replicating these experiments. I mean, if he turned out to be right about any one of these things, 
you know, the cancer research, even if it didn't lead to some kind of immediate cure. His idea was that it means you really understand that you have to focus on prevention. Mm -hmm. And what leads to the kind of loss of energetic charge in the tissues that starts them breaking down into bions and bions clumping together into cancer cells? Well, one of the single most important things he found in among the patients that he dealt with was emotional resignation, especially from having a completely miserable, unhappy sexual life. But emotional resignation is something like researchers in the 1960s are finally saying seems to have some kind of correlation with risk of cancer. Um, and But he was trying to tell us that back in the 1930s and to tell us that I can even tell you the mechanism for how that leads to, you know, tissue disintegration and production of cancer cells. Um, but you do have to look into the microscope in order to see whether or not his um, observations were correct, mm -hmm. or at least look at the time-lapse films in his archives. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, are you currently working on this scientific biography? Yeah, I uh, I started the archival work for it last year. Um, I mean, obviously, the archival work that I did for the previous book will be relevant, but that really does cover only 1934 to 1939. And the scientific biography is a story from 1919 to 1957. So how long is, how so, long is the book going to be? Multi Multi-volume? I had a conversation with my son about this <laughs> when, when I told him that I was working on this last year. He said, so how long is it going to be, Dad? And I said, ah, this is such a huge story. I can't even imagine. I mean, it might take me like 1,500 pages to tell this story. And he just shook his head and said, no, Dad, that's not how it's going to be. And he, I have a shelf full of scientific biographies that I've been reading mm. as a way of sort of trying to get myself into, all right, what does a biography look like? Mm -hmm. And he pulled two or three of them off the shelf and started flipping through them and said, these are like 500 pages, maybe. And even if you squeeze in a bunch of notes after that, nobody's going to read a book that's more than 500 pages. Well, there are a few exceptions that people have read that are more than 500 pages, but... I'm not looking for an academic press. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for once for a trade press because I would like a lot of people to read this story, mm -hmm. not just a small handful of people who pay what they charge at a major academic press. Um, and that means it's going to have to be readable. Mm -hmm. So somehow or other, this 1,500 or 2,000 page story is going to have to be squeezed into 500 pages. Um, don't ask me yet how that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's the part I can think about as I go along. <laughs> <laughs> but the research is fascinating. I mean, like detective work, I just can, fascinating. I can imagine. Well, I'll be sure to put links for Wilhelm Reich Biologist uh, in the description below. Um, I think people could probably still find a copy from various places. But I mean, is there anything you'd like to add about specifically about that book? Um, you feel we haven't touched it, it? It's still in print. There's a website that accompanies the book where I published a bunch of additional information, including some material from Reich's archives that I got permission from his trust to publish. Uh, his correspondence with a couple of other scientists, for example, that were um, that involved a lot of detail about the Bion experiments. Um, and uh, it, it, the book's still in print, so um, it's certainly available to read. Um, and it would give you a good opportunity, I guess, to decide whether or not you thought it was worth your time to read a 500 page biography <laughs> somewhere down the line when it finally appears. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, the story couldn't be more relevant. I mean, Reich's book, the mass psychology of fascism, uh, students of mine were reading it during the 2016 election mm -hmm. in October of 2016. And it's written in 1933, right after the Nazi seizure of power. And it's a description of how the Nazis manipulated mass psychology to get people to vote for things that were plainly not in their own interest, including a guy named Adolf Hitler. And um, 
when students came in in October of 2016 after having read this book and watched television for the U.S. presidential campaign that year with Trump um, in class the next day, they were just white faced <laughs> saying, uh, when did you say this was written? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you look around at the, you know, populist nationalist movements everywhere, Reich's book, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, is more relevant than it has ever been since the 1930s. Um, yeah, uh, but I would encourage people to read Reich. Um, don't read my books. Go read Reich. Um, because then if you have an opinion about him, you'll know that it's not based on what somebody else said about Reich, mm -hmm. which is <laughs> what the vast majority of people's opinions are based on. Where would you uh, where don't would you... Es especially don't read the Wikipedia article because every time I try to edit it, my edits are removed by somebody who thinks that no, he's making this guy look like he's not crazy after all. Where would you advise people to begin with Reich? Uh, I think the best book to begin with Reich is his scientific autobiography up to 1940, a book called The Function of the Orgasm. Mm. Um, it's a great place to begin because it's it's really engaging reading. It's really um, hard to put down. And uh, it gives you a pretty good overview of at least the first half of his career um, up to, as I said, about 1940 when it was finished. Um, and it's really fascinating. Uh, but it'll quickly help you decide whether or not you feel like this stuff means anything to you or not, because it's a good overview. Mm -hmm. well, and it's always fun to be carrying around a book called The Function of the Orgasm. Oh, absolutely. Still scares Real people. conversation starter. Still scares people, mm -hmm. which is, you know, ironic in terms of what we're just talking about. <laughs> but it especially it gives you a chance to start that conversation about what orgastic potency means, you know. Yeah, I know the title looks like this guy is saying that sex will cure everything, but that's not what he's saying. <laughs> well, like I said, I'll be should have put the links for Wilhelm Reich biologist in the description below um and hopefully in the years down the line we could chat again about the 2000 page biography <laughs> that be released. But, uh, i will be happy to when the time comes but uh yeah james james strick it's been great thanks very much thank you i really appreciate it